Well, thank you for this invitation to, to speak at CMU. I am a CMU alumni, a Tepper alumni. We were across the, the street uh, when I was uh, an undergrad. And I'm really uh, glad to be able to talk about what's really an important, uh, uh, an important uh, topic. So what I'm going to do here is kind of give you the context of this coronavirus. And I work at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, which is an infectious disease think tank that works on the intersection of infectious disease and national security. So we work on pandemic preparedness, bioterrorism preparedness, anything that really uh, involves an emerging infectious disease outbreak. So we've been on this for, for quite some time and doing a lot of work trying to understand what will happen. And what I'm going to do in this talk, and I'm going to, I have about 28 slides and I'm going to open it up for questions uh, for the remaining hour is try and put this in the proper context because for many people they have not heard of coronaviruses before this outbreak. So I want to kind of take you back in time and really get you to think about what coronaviruses were like. And SARS is the real inflection point with coronaviruses. I'm going to go into detail about SARS. But what, was, what were coronaviruses like before SARS and then after SARS? Talk a little bit about that viral family. Talk about the new virus that we're dealing with now. And then try to understand some of the, the issues that are going on with the clinical management of these patients, as well as where this outbreak may go. And some of this might, if it's too technical, just wave your hand if I'm getting too technical. If I'm, I'm used to speaking to biology-ish type of people. Uh, and not, and, but I, I have a, a lot of stuff in there that, may, that will, be, will appeal to the general public as well. But if there's something that doesn't make sense, just wave, wave at me, and I'll explain it. So what happened? Let's just step back. COVID-19 is what we're dealing with now. What happened was in mid to late December, there was a cluster of pneumonia cases without a diagnosis found in China. There were 41 cases and they were linked to an animal market. China is a place where there is a lot of intersection between humans and animals, so it's a hot spot for disease emergence. Pneumonia cases occurred. They tested for the usual suspects. They didn't know, they couldn't find anything. So they did rapid sequencing, looking for genetic material of other known virus families that might be there. And they found a novel coronavirus that l seemed to be initially linked to the animal market. This was the first red fl flag that went up, uh, that, that there was a new coronavirus in China linked to animal exposure. And that got people thinking, how can we, how do we risk stratify this? What does this mean? They notified the WHO. And they were really at that point thinking that this was mostly an animal to human jump without human to human spread. That quickly changed because as soon as they started publishing the case details, their first case got sick on December 1st and he had no contact with the animal market, which tells you that this virus was likely spreading before December 1st in November in that area and had the ability to spread from human to humans because this man had no contact with animal markets. So that already gives you something that shouldn't surprise you now when you hear about community spread of this virus, that this was already doing this in November and you gave a virus that had the ability to spread human to human a major head start. So from the start, this was not really a containable virus in my opinion, because it was spread through the respiratory route, which is very easy for things to go. Just think about the common cold and it had a huge head start. And people were traveling from Wuhan to all kinds of places before that time. So that really tells you that likely there was spread outside of China even before we knew about this. What we started hearing about then were these cases were very sick individuals in the hospital. And what that does is, is it creates a severity bias. You hear a lot about very, very sick cases, but you don't hear about the mild cases because they're not being tested. They're not coming to attention. So when you look at these case fatality ratios, they are often skewed because they're really looking at hospitalized patients, not the child that has a runny nose or just has a sore throat. They're not getting tested. So when you hear about this 2% case fatality rate in Hubei province in China, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what we're going to experience everywhere else. Indeed, if you look outside of that province, the case fatality rate goes down to less than 1%. So there is a severity bias, and that's important to know about when you're looking at the interpretation here. And we may find this virus has a mortality rate of much lower than 1%. We've seen human to human spread occur, and that's one of the important issues with this virus. So when you go to other coronaviruses like SARS, which were very scary, which is very scary, kills about 10% of the people it infects, it didn't spread very well between humans, and that was a big factor in how we contained it. When you have efficient human to human spread, it makes it very hard to contain a virus. I have a number there are not. If any of you have watched the movie Contagion, I'm sure you've watched that. And this is CMU, and I know people like math at CMU. I, I like math. And an R0 is a mathematical concept of how many other people you can infect. So an R0 of one means that you infect one other person. For a virus to sustain in the environment and transmit, it has to be above one. You have to infect more people than yourself. 
Measles has an R naught of about 15. It's the most contagious disease known to humans. So if I was standing here with measles, all of you would have been exposed to measles. This R naught is somewhere around 2 to 2.4. We don't really know where it sits. So it is able to infect humans, but it's not transmissible in the way measles is. There's this large spectrum of illness. I said, I, I alluded to this earlier, that there are cases that are very mild. Most cases don't even need hospitalization. Over 80% of cases in China with that severity bias sample are mild. So not everybody that gets this is going to need to be in the hospital. That's really important to remember because that helps this virus spread. Because if you're in the hospital, you're much less likely to spread it than if you're out being able to go do your activities of daily living. So that's a very adept evolutionary mechanism that, that you don't make your host too sick so that you want them to go out and infect other people. We've talked about that there's less deaths outside of China. This is a, a virus that, you know, that really is stable in humans. It's not mutating that much because it's actually efficiently transmitting between humans. And it likely came from a single introduction from an animal into a human, and then it spread because it had that capacity. I've got some fancy pictures up there just kind of showing you where it fits uh, in, the, in the coronavirus family. But I'm going to get into the coronavirus family uh, shortly. This is the latest data that we have on this virus from the Johns Hopkins uh, map. And there's 82,000 cases with 2,810 deaths. And you can see the vast majority of these cases are in China. Uh, there are less cases outside of China, but this is something that we can expect to see in many different countries because, as I said, it has the ability to spread between humans. So now I'm going to take you from this, this coronavirus back a long time to, in something very simple, to the common cold. And I used to give this lecture, and people get very bored when we talk about the common cold, but this has become really important. So the common cold is just a general clinical syndrome, and it's caused by many different types of viruses. And people knew that there are many different viruses, and I list some of them there. Uh, that you can get, you know, rhinovirus is probably the most common cause of the, of the common cold. Other viruses like RSV, which you might have heard about, causes infections in babies. There was this whole slew of viruses. And that's what they thought caused the common cold. But it was clear that a third of the cases, they could not find anything. But these pa patients, when you took their secretion, so if you took their nasal mucus and put it in another person, they would get sick. But they didn't have one of those virus. So there was some virus that they couldn't find. And what ended up happening was, in 1960, they had a boy who was able to transmit symptoms from his mucus, and they could not find any type of virus. And it wasn't a bacteria because it went through a filter, and they found a new virus at that time in 1960. And that was the, the first isolation of a coronavirus in humans. And you can see here on the electron micrograph, it has these little spikes, and that's where it gets its name, kind of like its crown. And then they similarly found a second virus in 1967. And those were the two coronaviruses that were responsible for about a quarter of the cases of the common cold, OC43 and 229E. And that's all we knew about coronaviruses for quite a long time. And we found coronaviruses in many different animals. Uh, so lots of, if, if there are people that work on farms, there are bovine coronaviruses that infect cows. There are pig coronaviruses. And this was a whole family of viruses, but only two were known to infect humans. From, from basically 1960 all the way to uh, 2003. It's a, it's a large viral family. It, it's, it has RNA as its genetic material. And it just, it's something that we, we had seen for a, a while. I won't belabor the point of the family and where this all fits. But just to know that it's not this single coronavirus. People keep saying the coronavirus. There is not the coronavirus. It's one member of a large family that we're dealing with. And coronaviruses occur everywhere. They're worldwide. And they usually peak in the winter and spring in temperate areas. So places like the northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere have a temperate climate. You see a peak in the winter and the spring every year. And like I said, they cause about 15 to 25% of the common colds. All of you have had a coronavirus infection in your life, just not this coronavirus. So it's really important to remember that because people don't quite get that idea that the coronaviruses have always been around. It's just we found a new one that seems to be a little bit more severe. And you get reinfected with coronaviruses because antibodies fall. So that's what we know about coronaviruses. And it's really common in children. Children would have, can have mild symptoms, but they get them. Everybody gets coronaviruses. What happened with, with SARS was a little bit interesting. So this was a, corona, a novel coronavirus that was discovered in 2002, 2003 in China. And it spread from bats, where all coronaviruses in general reside in bats. Bats have lots of different viruses in them. All the coronaviruses are naturally in bats. And what happens are bats can then spill that into other animals. So for example, with SARS, the coronavirus went from bats to something called the palm civet cat, which was a delicacy in certain parts of China. People were preparing that, eating it, and that actually started this 
cascade of infections. And what happened was the SARS coronavirus wasn't very transmissible between humans, but there were these people, what we called super spreaders, that had the ability to infect a lot of people. That one person infects a disproportionate number of people. And that really allowed SARS to get around very quickly. And what it really refers to is heterogeneity and pathogen transmission. So all of you have heard of the typhoid super spreader. Can someone say her name? Yeah, typhoid Mary. So typhoid Mary was a super spreader for, for salmonella typhi, which causes typhoid fever. And that really tells you that you know, in any infectious disease, there may be like 20% of people that are responsible for 80% of the infections. So little children in daycare centers, those are super spreaders. That's a, that's a live super spreader that you'll see. Just think about all the snot that emanates from them and what they touch and where they put their hands. That's a super spreader. But we've seen them with HIV, tuberculosis. That happened with SARS as well. And that's how SARS basically enveloped the world in, in basically very quickly, uh, caused about uh, 800 deaths, 8,000 cases, and $35 billion of losses, economic losses. Often these patients have runny noses and they're wiping their, their, their nose. The runny nose is an easy way to, to spread something. But that's what happened with SARS. And, and that's what, what really got people worried was the, the super, our super spreading events occurring with this virus. And there may, be, ha, may have had some occur, but it happens with every type of virus that you have these individuals. The other thing about SARS that I want to bring your mind to is the fact that this happened in China and it was covered up. Uh, that initially these cases were treated in military hospitals. There was a big crackdown on information. And these are just some of the, these are just some of the cartoons from that time looking at what happened with SARS in 2003. And many people have forgotten about SARS. I was a, a training physician at that time, so it was something that was quick in my mind, it quickly comes to mind, but really people thought that SARS was uh, mishandled severely by the Chinese government, and that's what's probably triggered this kind of draconian, this, this draconian response that you've seen in China now with locking down 60 million people. After SARS, then people thought, these coronaviruses are important. They have pandemic potential. We need to keep looking for more coronaviruses. And since that time, for, we, they, found two other, they found three other coronaviruses before this one. One of them is an interesting story, and it's called HKU1. And I won't belabor it too much, but they found this in a patient that had pneumonia in China in 2004. And then they started looking at bank specimens, and they realized that this, was, this new coronavirus was present at the same time as SARS. And they even looked, for example, in in, China, uh, in, in Cleveland, of all places. They looked in Cleveland, and they actually found it in Cleveland just circulating around there. So there's, a, there's an issue with coronaviruses being out there in the community and not being diagnosed, because they're just there, and they mostly cause mild illness. So that's just an important point to know about when you go to the doctor and you've got a pneumonia or you have an upper respiratory tract infection, you don't always get a specific diagnosis. You're told you've got some virus. And sometimes that virus might be important. Sometimes it might not be important. And we don't really do all that fancy diagnostic testing to figure out what all these people have because we don't have antivirals for all of those things and most people get better. But there's this huge amount of biological dark matter out there of people who have just common colds that aren't actually diagnosed to a specific level because it, people get over it. We have the technology to do that, but it's something that hasn't really taken off uh, because of the cost and because of the way med healthcare is reimbursed in the United States that you don't necessarily get an advantage to doing a fancy test to figure out this person has this virus that you just, they're going to get better from anyway. But it's really important when it comes to pandemic preparedness to know what's out there because you can have viruses like HKU1, which was another coronavirus that was there and people just didn't know about it until they actually look for it. So what do coronaviruses cause? Like I said, they cause the common cold. So that's fever, cough, sore throat, runny nose. With this coronavirus, you're seeing some more GI symptoms, so nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And we tell, tend to see coronavirus cause pneumonia and more severe disease in the immunosuppressed, the elderly, uh, and infants. Uh, interestingly, with this novel coronavirus, it's been less prominent in children in terms of the symptoms. It's more the older adults. Those are the other medical um, conditions that really have severe illness. Just, just to go back to SARS, 8,000 cases, 800 deaths, about a 10% mortality rate. The thing with SARS was that 25% of the people got what's called ARDS, which stands for Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, basically lung failure or respiratory failure, which made it very, very challenging to treat those patients. There weren't any, so in 2003, SARS happened. We started to develop treatments for SARS and think about what to, what to do about SARS. But what ended up happening is SARS went away because it didn't have efficient human-to-human -human spread, and people stopped dealing with the palm civet cat that was spilling it into human populations. So SARS disappeared. So if you're a, a so we're at Tepper, so you're a big pharmaceutical manufacturing company, what's the one thing that you want to have in hand before you start deciding to embark on a development program? 
you really want to have a, a certainty of the market. You want to know, is there going to be a buyer? But SARS disappeared. So all the work that they did was for naught, really. It all got put in shelves, on shelves, because there was no demand for this. And that's the big problem with emerging infectious disease countermeasures, that the market size is so uncertain. You don't know how long this thing is going to last. You don't know who's going to buy it. And then sometimes there's a lot of negative PR that happens to you. So for example, during the Zika outbreak, Sanofi Pasteur developed the Zika vaccine with the US military. And what ended up happening is this was a, a contract that the US military had with Sanofi. Somebody wrote a, an op-ed in the New York Times, uh, S Senator Bernie Sanders wrote an op-ed in the, the New York Times criticizing Sanofi for this, this uh, arrangement. And what happened was uh, we don't have a Zika virus vaccine because Sanofi said this is a really bad PR thing for us. We're not even going to do this anymore uh, if we're going to get this kind of negative PR. So it's really important that, that you think about what the, what the cascading effects are of, of, of doing it, because it's the pharmaceutical companies that have the expertise to make these vaccines and to manufacture them at scale. And they don't want to be in emerging infectious diseases because of all the market uncertainty and the opportunity cost, because they could be making drugs for cancer, drugs for hypertension, uh, lifestyle, other vaccines like, like H, the HPV vaccine, which is part of the seasonal vaccine schedule. So when we don't have a treatment for SARS or any coronavirus now, 17 years later, it, it, it makes complete sense if you actually understand the emerging infectious disease pharmaceutical market. So just a couple more facts about SARS. I think we went, to, we went through this just to give you a little bit of highlight. There's a picture of a, a palm civet cat. Um, uh, this was bats to palm civets to humans in September 2003 was really when you saw this, uh, uh, before 2003 is when you really saw the force of, of spread. What ended up happening after that is very, very, very few cases. It disappeared and it's basically not a threat agent anymore because people don't really think about it because it was clearly it's still in bats it's still in certain animal populations but we change those behaviors and it doesn't spread very well between humans and most people don't remember that we actually had SARS cases in the United States there were actually eight cases of SARS in the United States and I list them here I don't need to belabor that but there was a patient in Pennsylvania as well that had uh, that had it as well and, and it was treated at, at very um, small community hospitals and did did fairly well and with our SARS patients we did we did, we did well. We had eight SARS patients at nine hospitals and 110 healthcare workers were exposed with no secondary transmission of SARS. So we did okay with SARS and then SARS went away. So now in the interim, we're still looking for coronaviruses, looking for coronaviruses. We find these two new ones and then something else happens in 2011. And I think most of you have heard of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS. This was another novel coronavirus that was, uh, was really in the headlines around 2012 uh, through 2014. And this one, again, finds its origin in bats, but the intermediate host is not a palm civet cat. Does anybody know what the intermediate host is? Camels. And people might think that's odd. Why would camels be a major intermediate host? But people in certain parts of the world, camels are their pets. They treat them like dogs. Um, they, they, may, they may kiss them. So th just like what, we do, what, what people do with dogs, they can do with camels, and that creates an opportunity for spread. So this was a novel coronavirus, and basically, again, a cluster of illnesses that they couldn't figure out what was going on in Saudi Arabia. They found a novel coronavirus. And then it took a while because the Saudi government really didn't want that to get out. Eventually, somebody got transported to, to the UK and they identified a novel coronavirus. And they realized, looking backwards, back in April of 2012, there were cases too that went undiagnosed, which is another theme that we don't do very well at diagnosing things down to a specific species level. And then we saw this basically spread to many countries very, very quickly. And we have an increasing number of cases. Cases are occurring now with MERS as we speak. There are cases going on in the Arabian Peninsula. And it has about a 35% case fatality rate, which is much higher than what we're dealing with now. Again, like SARS, MERS is very inefficient from transmitting from human to human. It transmits from camels to humans, but not so much between humans. That's why it's less of a threat. But when it first came out, People were very worried about, about, the, about the MERS coronavirus. It's now slipped from people's minds, but this is one of the headlines during that time. This is one of the, the cartoons. This was a new coronavirus. People were nervous about it, and it was something that wasn't very transmissible between humans, so that threat kind of went away. And we've had a couple of cases of MERS in the United States as well, too, to be uh, exact. And MERS fit, so this is just looking at the viral families. I just gonna just spend one, so this is the SARS, this is where SARS is. This is where the new virus is just like SARS. Some people are calling it SARS-2. Uh, this is MERS is down here. Um, and then you have other, other human viruses. It's a, vi a big viral family. This is just to show you that there's not just one coronavirus. There's a lot of them and they're all in bats. 
and they found related viruses to the MERS coronavirus in bats, and it, and, and it was linked to camels, especially camels with snotty noses. <laughs> MERS did create a big explosive outbreak in South Korea that actually caused people to have, lose confidence in the government where they had an imported case from the Middle East and this patient misdiagnosis at multiple different hospitals and basically had 186 cases and 36 deaths all in, uh, in South Korea in a very short period of time. And people were very nervous about that happening in, in South Korea when it occurred. We did have two cases in the United States of MERS. Both were mild, uh, did really well at small, didn't even need to be hospitalized. Um, so now I want to turn a little bit to what's going on with the novel coronavirus. And like I said, there's this severity bias. We're hearing a lot about very, very sick patients. But we don't have a clear idea on the severity because we're not testing individuals with mild illness. And what we do know, though, is that maybe, according to that data, 10 to 20 percent are going to be severe. And when you think about how our U.S. hospitals operate, that's, that becomes a little bit scary because most hospitals do not have much excess bed capacity. They're often running near capacity. They're often managing their beds in creative ways. And this could create a problem if we get any number of cases. Because we, do, we don't do very well even with a bad seasonal flu. We have people being treated in tents sometimes when they, they clogged up the emergency department. And we have to think about what will happen, for example, in critical care units where you have ice, we have maybe have minimal ICU beds in a hospital where you have a certain number of ventilators, where you have a certain number of isolation rooms because you have to put these patients in isolation. And I think that's really important to think about now. So thinking about what your mechanical ventilation supplies are at hospitals, thinking about ICU bed capacities, how are you going to isolate these patients? Some people are using very fancy modalities like ECMO, which is a heart-lung machine. Are we going to be doing that? How are we going to be using uh, experimental antivirals? And these are some CAT scans looking at the lungs. They should be all black, in the, but this white stuff is the pneumonia that's occurring in these patients. So that's something that's really important to keep in mind, but it's not unprecedented. And I think that the best example that people should keep in mind is the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic, which has slipped from most people's minds. Uh, just a couple of, of, of figures on that. So, do you know how, so within six months, one billion people were infected with the H1N1 virus. And we had a different approach to that because people recognized this is flu, therefore it is not containable. We didn't have that approach here. We kind of started with this containment methodology, which has really diverted public health resources to travel bans, to border restrictions, to quarantine, versus ramping up diagnostics, helping hospitals get ready to prepare for the cases that they may have, public health communications, uh, vaccine development, antiviral clinical trials. All of that is really where our efforts should be, should be spent, not necessarily trying to, um, tr not necessarily trying to basically keep this away because it's not going to be something that's containable. Just a couple of figures. I don't want to belabor too much of 2009, but remember 61 million cases occurred in the United States of 2009 H1N1, and we had about 12,500 deaths, which is lower than we get with seasonal flu, but it was something that happened. And 38% developed really bad respiratory failure. And we started to learn about get, giving people antiviral treatment very quickly. But this was a major threat to, to the United States when this happened. People forget about it because the number of deaths wasn't that high, but if you look at the number of people, the, the, the people who died, the median age during 2009 was not like 75, like what it is during a normal seasonal flu. It was in the 30s and 40s. So if you think about when the people who died from H1N1, where they were in their stage of life, and then multiply it by how many years of life they had left, it actually is a pretty severe pandemic if you look at the number of life years lost rather than looking at it as straight, a straight number. So it's really important when you look at pandemics. But this is something we dealt with in, and we had to rapidly scale up diagnostics. We had to get hospitals ready. We had to be able to take care of patients with, with in, in ICUs. We had to get them antiviral treatment. But it was something that was really uh, uh, a challenge for the healthcare system. And I can remember as a, as, a, as a physician dealing with those patients. So in the last couple of slides before we go to, before we go to um, uh, questions, I want to give you just a little bit of what I think it is about coronaviruses. So coronaviruses are a large family. They can infect lots of different animals. I put up that slide where we know it comes from bats, but it can infect cats, dogs, uh, pigs, cows, lots of, different lots of different mammalian hosts. So they have lots of potential avenues to infect humans. It can, there, are some, uh, there is some ability that this virus can recombine and get newer combinations of it. It also is something that happens worldwide. There are coronaviruses all over the world. And it is spread through the respiratory route. When something is spread through the respiratory route, as I alluded to earlier, it is very hard to, to stop that kind of transmission. Very different if something is transmitted through blood and body fluids like Ebola. That's very easy to stop the transmission. You just make sure people have gowns and gloves. 
and, and not get exposed to body fluids. If something is transmitted through uh, food, for example, you stop them eating that food. Or if something is transmitted through fecal oral, you can just increase, uh, increase sanitation and you don't necessarily have transmission. It's much harder with respiratory viruses. And the fact that they're in bats makes it very hard to deal with because there are so many bats all over the world and they can travel long distances. So you can see different places with different bat viruses. And it's not just coronaviruses that are in bats. Remember that rabies comes from bats as well. As, and that's one of the big problems why we can never get a handle on rabies because it's always in bat populations. So what do I think is going to happen? I think that you know, not, lots of people aren't using the pandemic word, but we are in a pandemic for all intents and purposes. We have over two dozen countries with cases. We have efficient human to human spread of a respiratory pathogen. We are in a pandemic, but that does not mean when you say the word pandemic, that that means it's a severe pandemic. There, pandemics can come in all different flavors. They can be mild, moderate, severe. And I think we're in that kind of mild to moderate level pandemic is what we're thinking about. We don't quite know how many people will have severe illness yet, how many people will die because we don't have a good idea on how well this is spread into a community. But I do think we're in a pandemic, but it doesn't mean that we need to panic about it. It means that you need to be very um, alert to what's going on in your local community. Look and see what your local health departments are doing. Look and see what's going on at the, at, at the organizations you belong to, like for example at CMU, what is their plan? What is their plan if they get community spread here? Thinking about what to do ahead of time before we actually have to deal with it on the fly. I don't think this is going to go away. I think that we're going to have, I talked about the fact that we have these coronaviruses that circulate every year and cause about a quarter of our common colds. I think this will be the fifth coronavirus that will, have, will be doing that, that we're going to be left with it for some time. I think that we will have to deal with this again in the fall next year when coronavirus season starts in the northern hemisphere. Hopefully by then we have a vaccine and we have the time to get a vaccine. But I do think that this is going to be with us because it's becoming what we say is endemic in the human population. It's not going to go away because it can spread efficiently from human to human. SARS couldn't do that. MERS couldn't do that. That's why they're not endemic in the human population. And I've got some pictures of some black swans there. I don't think this is a black swan event. But I do think that we risk the, we, we risk making this much worse than it is because the reactions are often much worse than what the virus has caused. So when you think about what China did, that, that China had basically 60 million people, more than the population of Canada, under lockdown, using very draconian methods, violating people's individual rights. They, they actually um, penalized that doctor who was one of the first to give, give an alert on his alumni mes message board saying, I'm seeing something interesting here. They, they actually charged him with the crime. He's now dead. That's not the right way to do that. It's also not the right way to do it. Is, uh, well, also what Japan did is not the right thing to do, is to put people on a, a Hollywood horror show type of boat and allow this virus to pick them off one by one in a, in a boat. Uh, so that's also not the right thing to do. So I do think we have to think about how we move forward with this and how do we, how do we deal with this without disrupting the entire globe. And it's going, to be, it's going to take some time for people to walk back this containment methodology that they're doing and start to say, this is not containable. Let's just now try to control this. And I think that's a big jump. And you can already see the CDC is starting to say that, and they're getting a huge mix. It's, it's, it's being reviewed as a mixed message. So from the start, I would have said, this is not going to be containable. Let's just deal with it and not be quarantining people and creating all of this type of panic that's going on with people disputing whether quarantine patients can be, quarantine people can be in their neighborhoods. All of that kind of stuff could have been avoided if you say, this is, this is not going to be containable. We need to just really work on, on fortifying our, our ability to be resilient to it. So what do we do now? Um, I do think that healthcare preparation is the number one thing that needs to happen now. Hospitals need to think about how they're going to deal with the surge of patients, making sure they're adequately staffed. There's going to be disruptions. I think that's mostly going to be local government induced. People are going to start canceling things. People are going to start panicking. Local politicians are notorious for doing this type of thing. And remember, politicians don't get penalized for being wrong that often. They get pe they're, they, they're much more likely to respond to constituents who want them to do something, even if it is the wrong thing, than actually do what science or public health dictates. So that's going to happen over and over again. Just expect that to happen. And I don't think that people should panic. But you should, in, in one way to ensure against panic is to have trusted sources for news. Uh, I think this is a, this, we're, we live in an era of misinformation uh, that occurs on a you know, daily basis. There's new conspiracy theories about this virus, and I think it's really important to, uh, to find your trusted sources of, uh, of news and, and use those. So that could include the CDC, the WHO. Some of the, the, the mainstream media is actually not that bad. There are good science reporters and health reporters. That's who you should be reading, not necessarily the front page, but the science page uh, where you get really good uh, reporting and also there's a, a news outlet called STAT that if you've heard about it it's owned by the Boston Globe that's probably the best uh, reporting in, in, the, in the world on, on these types of issues. 
So that's all I have for this presentation. I hope that was helpful, and I'm happy to take questions in the remaining half hour. I left a lot of time for questions because I just wanted to give you a flavor of where, where this is all fitting, and then uh, allow you guys to ask as many questions as you have because I think you might have some, and I might not have covered everything in, in the right de amount of detail. So I'm happy to take questions, and thanks again for inviting me. Sure, it's not that it's more common, it's that the testing, the, what we're, the confirmed cases are more likely to be in men that are older, and that has to do with the severity bias, because those are the people who are getting very ill from it. It doesn't mean that children are not getting, it just means that children are doing really well with it and not really having the need to go to a healthcare provider to be tested, because we know children can be infected. It's just that, like many infectious diseases, that when you get it as a child, it's not as severe as when you get it as an adult, and that's what's happening, uh, likely, with this coronavirus. My understanding is it's using the same, the, the same protein. Uh, it uses, I think it's the spike protein on the virus that's actually the fusion protein that allows it to fuse with cells and it's conserved between bats and other mammalian species and humans. And each of the coronaviruses, I took that slide out because it was too technical, but each of the coronaviruses have different, different receptors. This coronavirus uses the same receptor as SARS, which is in your lungs, um, but other coronaviruses have different receptors. Uh, so it's a little bit varies between the coronavirus, but they have the same receptor. I don't think you should panic. I think that you should look at the CDC travel website. There are certain countries that you might not want to visit right now. And it's not so much because of the virus, but you also could get trapped there because of those restrictions that are going on. So right now, the CDC has two level three notices, meaning do not go there for non-essential travel to both China and South Korea. They have a level two advisory to Italy right now. So you should, if you have health problems, you should reconsider going there. Um, and that may change over time as the world gets encompassed by it. I don't think that there's anything specific for the individual person to do, it's just to really be alert, wash your hands a lot when, when you're in areas where there's lots of common touch type of surfaces that you may be touching, avoid sick people as best you can, but there's not much else that you can, you can do at this point. But, I, and, but to your first point, you know, there, China, ha, China was very draconian and very authoritative in what they did and using a lot of authoritarian means, and it's actually set a bad example because other countries are now following that. And even the WHO is giving them sort of a pass for what they did. And it's set a bad example because you see other countries, such as South Korea, doing that type of thing. You've seen uh, aggressive lockdowns in Italy. We don't want that to be the way you deal with, with an infectious disease that's not going to be containable. Because when it spreads, people are going to say, oh, those containment methods failed. But those containment methods were never going to work. And, and, it, you, and it, then it actually gets people to say, maybe we should have been even more aggressive with those people. But that's actually not the case with the respiratory virus that spreads efficiently. There was no chance in containment, in my opinion. I think it's going overboard if you're a member of the general public. I don't think that you need to be wearing a mask everywhere. I just traveled internationally yesterday, uh, and I did not wear a mask. Uh, and I saw people wearing their masks around their neck or having their nose out. So most people who wear those, nose, those masks don't use them appropriately. 
if you've ever put on an N95 mask, and I have to do that when I take care of patients with tuberculosis, that's not something you can wear for more than a couple minutes without feeling very uncomfortable. People have done studies. That actually changes your blood chemistry because of how constrictive that is. I would not wear a mask as a member of the general public. If you're sick and you have to go out, that's a different story. Then you may, maybe should wear a surgical mask. Or if you're in a healthcare setting or taking care of a sick person, then you, may wear, you should wear a mask. But for the general public, I would not. So I would probably take it the other way, that that 1% to 2% is probably higher than what the actual percentage is. Not that there's undiagnosed fatalities, but that there are undiagnosed mild cases. Because we know a lot about coronaviruses, and we know that most cases are going to be mild. So I would say that that 1% to 2% will actually fall. Because right now, it's 2% in Hubei province. But if you look outside of Hubei province, even in China, it's 0.7%. So there is something going on in the Hubei province that is, that is driving those, that, that death rate. And I think that it may have to do with the fact that those hospitals are inundated. There's a lot of public panic there. There are shortages of basic goods there because of the quarantine that's gone on. So I don't put much stock in that 2%. I think it's going to be lower when you actually, actually look, uh, especially since we have experience from other parts of China as well as the other, other parts of the, the world. I do think that Healthcare interventions can play a role. If people are getting the wrong intervention, they're coming to treatment too late, the people aren't managing their ICUs appropriately in terms of how to run the mechanical ventilator, all of those types of stuff may have, may have some impact in it. And I think it will be really important to look at the, the critically ill patients in other countries and see how they're managed to see where the, the fatality rate is. Because even, for example, with Ebola, we had to been taught it was 90% fatal. But when you used a little bit of Western medicine, just giving people IV fluids and electrolytes for Ebola, the fatality rate dropped from 90% to 20%. So it's really, there is really a dependency on what's going on. China does have a modern healthcare system in the sense that they have access to all those modalities. So I think having WHO in Wuhan to actually look at those patients and their clinical care will be important because it is a discrepancy that we can't quite explain right now. So the, incub the incubation period is up to 14 days, so, but the average incubation period is about six days. Most people do get six, sick within six days, but we're, quarantine we're keeping people in isolation. We're thinking about quarantines for 14-day periods because that seems to be the upper limit of that. But everybody's incubation period is a little bit different, and it may depend upon how much virus you are exposed to in your own host immune system. I think it will be in the hundreds of billions. Of, I think it's going, to, it's going to be higher than SARS. Uh, SARS was 8,000 cases, $34 billion in losses. Uh, this is already at 80,000, and we're seeing really draconian measures shutting down. And China is much more a part of the global economy now in 2020 than it was in 2003. So it's really going to be magnified. So that's a, that's a good question and, and very cutting edge technology. So vaccines traditionally were made, you take a virus that suppose you took like the flu virus and you inactivated it or gave parts of that to somebody and you give them a vaccine, you attenuate it or change it. An mRNA vaccine basically takes the gene of interest in a, vac in a, in a virus or a bacteria, whatever your target is, just the gene part of that. And you take that, the sequence of that gene in an RNA form and inject that into somebody. It's very easy to come up with that mRNA segment that you're going to use for a vaccine candidate. That's why you've heard that Moderna has already delivered a vaccine candidate to the NIH because they're using an mRNA platform. That vaccine, that vaccine platform has a lot of advantages in terms of speeding delivery of the vaccine candidate. It still has to go through phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. And a lot of the companies that are using nucleic acid vaccines, both DNA and mRNA vaccines, are not big pharmaceutical companies with big manufacturing plants. So that's going to be another bridge to that we're going to have to cross is that if the candidate vaccine, the best vaccine is an mRNA or a DNA vaccine made by a company like Moderna or Inovia or whoever it might be, 
they're going to have to partner with somebody to be able to manufacture at the scale to vaccinate the world. But it is the best way, I think, right now to get a fast vac a vaccine candidate fast into clinical trials. And there are a whole bunch of different approaches, to even traditional approaches that are being tried. And it's important that we have as many vaccine candidates now as possible because we don't know which one will work. And there may be different vaccines for different scenarios and different populations. So RNA viruses tend to mutate more than DNA viruses in general. The, all, and all viruses mutate. So w often you get asked that question, is it mutating? And the answer is yes, it's mutating. And you are mutating too. Everything mutates that has nucleic acid. Most mutations, though, are not advantageous to a virus. And we do know that coronaviruses tend to be more stable. Their mutation rate is actually slower than many other viruses for some reason or the other. And so far, the, sequence, the sequences of the viruses that have been isolated from patients look to be generally stable. So we don't see any, uh, any mutation. And I don't know that there's any selection pressure right now. It's, eff it's effectively transmitting between humans. Uh, and it's causing mild illness. And that's all it really needs. Because all, all, you know, if you look at it, if you kind of anthropomorphize it, it really just wants to infect as many people as possible. And it's got all that, those ingredients already. I do think that this, this began in China in November. So there are countries where it was already very widespread when we learned about it. It hadn't spread all over the globe in high amounts, I, I would assume, until it still hasn't spread all over the globe in high amounts. So in countries where there was a small number of cases, it appears to be contained. But as we saw today with a diagnosis of a man in California who had no contact with China, it likely has been in the community. And because many cases are mild, clinically indistinguishable from the common cold or flu. If you, were, if you came to me, I don't have a diagnostic test, I can't tell you which one you have. It could have been mixed into our, mixed into many countries' cold and flu seasons and misdiagnosed. And since the vast majority of cases are mild, people got better, and, and that was that. So I don't think that there's this idea that it's contained in certain countries and in other countries. I think that really is a, a notion based on what, where testing was. And it wasn't going to be contained in China because it, it, that's where it probably started and it spread very, very far there. Uh, before they even noticed. We had a little bit of a head start in other countries, but I do think that it's not containable in any country. It just appears to be so now. So there is a there is a bio a bio level four the highest level containment lab in Wuhan and there had been some speculation about that lab's linkage to this but there's no evidence that this has any of the markers that it was artificially created uh, there are lots of you will find lots of things online saying that it was but there's no evidence that that this is where that originated from although there were concerns about that and there is always concerns about biosafety uh, that are really important that you have to run that kind of thing down but there's no evidence that that's actually uh, the case with this virus. We do know that coronaviruses tend to have this seasonality where they peak in the winter and spring and then taper off in, in the summer. That's only for the northern, that's for the, that's for the temperate parts, the northern and southern hemispheres. That doesn't, so when we have this decrease as we get into summer here in Pittsburgh, for example, they're not going to be in summer in Sydney, Australia. So it may increase in, in the northern hemisphere. And remember, the tropical area of the globe does not have seasonality to respiratory viruses. So we may see some decrease in northern hemisphere uh, as we get into summer, in, as we get into June and July. Uh, but that might not be the case over the globe. Uh, a related question. So I know you mentioned that you expected the coronavirus to be the next winner as well. Is that purely based on the estimated time to create a vaccine or something else? 
Right, the vaccine is not going to be available in large quantities for at least 12 to 18 months, but this virus is endemic in the human population. It's spreading efficiently from human to human. It's not going to go away. It's going to continue to spread between people, just like we'd see with common cold viruses. So I do think it will establish itself as a seasonal virus. If we get a vaccine, that may change things, and coronaviruses may become a thing of the past if we can remove it from the, the list of threats that we think about, but I do think we'll see it again. So there have been people that have went after common cold kind of holy grail types of treatments, but because the common cold is caused by so many different things, I think people thought oh, this is only going to get rid of 15 to 25 percent of the common cold, so it wasn't a high target, and most cases are mild. So that's why nobody really went after coronavirus vaccines, at least not in humans. They obviously do do them for agricultural uses because it, it can cause problems on, on dairy lots, for example, if you've got a lot of bovine coronavirus in your cows. But it hadn't been a big target, and now I think SARS got people to think differently about it, and then that went away, and then people just kind of, it all kind of, as something comes out of the headlines, people stop wanting to fund things, investors don't get interested in it anymore, and then it drops away. There definitely has been issues with trust from other governments, and we don't quite know what's going on in Iran, what type of secrecy with around those cases. The same is true of North Korea, which has reported zero cases, but there are reports of people dying in North Korea, and there is a porous border with parts of China there. So there definitely are concerns that what, what's going on in certain countries that have these types of authoritarian governments where they are very threatened by this virus. And I think you can even say that about China has been very threatened by this virus because it's really uh, eroding the trust in the, in the government uh, there.